This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. Happy holidays. It's getting close to the end here. Season one. Awesome information. Talk with some of the top smallmouth anglers across the country. And we're going to do it all over again, talking with some of the most dominant local and regional anglers for season two. So I'm looking forward to that, but we're not quite done yet. I'm excited. I hope you guys are enjoying season one, and I'm looking forward to hanging out with everyone for another long year talking bass fishing with everyone. But before we get into our next guest, let's talk about The Real Shot. Of course, The Real Shot's been a sponsor of the program all season long. They got everything you need for your big bass tournament or just a weekend on the water. Huge supply of tackle, even some hunting gear. Head on over to realshot.com and use my code smallmouthcrush15 and get 15% off your first order. Pretty cool deal. A lot of people are taking advantage of that. I encourage you to do so as well. Let's bring on our next guest, Coop, Coop, Cooper. How's it going? Another Canadian. You know, Coop and I, we met years ago. It was late at night. We were on the streets, I think, somewhere down in Greenville, South Carolina. Was that the town? Yep. I remember that. I don't know if we were both sober or not, but uh, it was pretty cool watching your career and watching you fish you know the last couple of years you've had some amazing accomplishments and i know you know how to catch largemouth and big trophy smallmouth so that's why i really wanted to get you on and, and pick your brain when it comes to smallmouth fishing but before we go there if you could just give us a, a quick background for for people that might not be familiar with yourself and a little bit of history and and um, where you call home yeah for sure i'm from bowmanville ontario which is about an hour east of toronto I've lived here since I was five years old and surrounded by water, rivers where steelhead run up. We got Lake Ontario, obviously, that has giant smallmouth and then a bunch of local lakes right here in the Durham region. Yeah, I'm, I obviously love bass fishing, but I love doing it all. I do a lot of trout fishing. I fish for carp. Uh, so, yeah. just Multi-species. Yeah, I definitely love doing it all, but I, I, there's a special place in my heart for tournament fishing. It's pretty amazing that whole part of the country and that section, the amount of fishing and, and resources that you have for different species. If anyone follows uh, you on Instagram, they'll see that you are into a wide range of, of different fishing when it comes to the Great Lakes and that that total region. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. I thought I thought I saw something with a big sturgeon recently. What's up with that? That, that wasn't close to home. It was in Canada, but it was in uh, British Columbia. Wow. We do a video series called The Road Trip, and we just scratch fishing trips off our bucket list. Me and my brother, we've always wanted to catch a sturgeon, so we made a, a 10-day trip up to the Fraser River in BC and did that. It was pretty incredible. How big was that thing? It was 9 feet 6 inches. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a big wow. 55 minutes to reel in. Our one buddy, Ruben, caught it. It was, it was insane, and he didn't hand the rod off either. Sure, sure. The whole time he reeled it in by himself, an hour and 55 minutes. That is crazy. That is crazy. Man, that, um, yeah, that does sound exciting. So, talk to me a little bit about your love for smallmouth. Probably started. It was a Bassmaster High School Championship. It was during the Eastern Regional through the Bass Nation. And we, me and my buddy, still tournament partner until this day, Danny McGarry, we fished the high school part of it. And we actually won the event with Smallies. That was about nine years ago, eight years ago. And I think that was the tournament that kind of gave us the love for catching big smalls. And that was on the St. Lawrence, actually. Oh, very cool. What would you consider your home body of water uh, to fish for smallmouth? Home body of water for smallmouth would be Rice Lake. Rice Lake. Talk to me about that place. Yeah, it's a cool place. It's chock full of big ones, a lot of little ones too, but... Uh, Typically on that lake, you need about, if it's a two-day derby, you need about 22 a day to win. 
Um, some guys, there's been socks, you know, 24, 25s brought in, which would be a big, big sock. But uh, yeah, super cool lake, uh, full of big smallies, big largies too, but mm-hmm. always have really taken over in the last last few years. Is it similar to a lot of the other bodies of water up that way, meaning clear water? Um, is it is a lot of structure, a lot of hard bottom? Yeah, it's a lot of hard bottom. They relate to hard bottom. There's actually shell beds out there, boulders, rock piles. As far as the water color, it's not clear. It's not even close to like oh, wow. okay. Lake Simcoe and lakes like that. It's actually quite stained, maybe a two-foot vis max. Mm. Are you able to catch them up shallow or, or deep, or what's your um, preferred way to catch them there? I like catching them deeper offshore. But uh, guys do come in with some big sacks shallow, especially in the fall. They'll get up on the sand and, and you can catch big ones doing that. But I like the I like the offshore deal. So you actually won that tournament years ago? Was that your yeah. first yeah. big win? What made you continue on with tournament fishing and kind of your love for the sport when it comes to that? That event, really. Like mm-hmm. that, that, that event really... You know, like just the whole experience, like even Bla- I'll never forget, you know, blast off them doing the anthem in the morning and and just the whole, you know, we were there for a week practicing. And I remember in practice, we we had found some big ones, just the feeling of knowing you're on some big ones and then actually mm-hmm. going out and, and executing and, and catching them was was the best feeling ever. And you know, even till this day, when you go out, it doesn't always happen, you know that. But uh, when you go out and you get on them, and it, it all works out, then it's, it's such a good feeling. So you mentioned on Rice Lake fishing deep. Is that what you would consider your strength or preferred way to catch smallmouth? And if not, what would that be? Um, in general, it's a hard one because I love catching them shallow too. We have Lake Simcoe. It's about an hour north of me. You can barely ever win out there deep especially midsummer you can win out deep in the fall but midsummer they're you know eight feet and less and you're sight fishing them and i love doing that um but if i had to choose oh that's a hard one i'd probably mm-hmm. say shallow, it's a shallow. looking at them i grew up steelhead fishing in the rivers and i i always like seeing how they react and what advice can you give to someone that's you know Let's say they, because there's a lot of great anglers um, that fish for smallmouth, especially ones that we've had at guests on this podcast, and they talked about sight fishing and going out visibly looking for these smallmouth. What are some tips that you can give the listeners and viewers when it comes to sight fishing for cruising smallmouth? I see so many people do it. They get on them too much. Stay back because they, they get, especially Lake Ontario and, and Lake Simcoe, they get so spooky. A lot of the times you get up on them and they're 10 times harder to get to bite as if you were to just stay back. And it's hard to do because a lot of times you don't know if they're there. And it all depends what they're relating to. Like if you know there's a, a big one on a boulder, stay back. You know where it's at and just fan cast until you land on them or, or close to them. But I think that's mm-hmm. one of the biggest things is don't get right on top of them. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Seems like like as good as as Simcoe is, it does get a lot of fishing pressure. I'm assuming, and you mentioned that it's rare to catch them out deep in the summer, or at least compete and do well in the tournament. So I can imagine during practice and just just anglers out having fun for that day, and then of course you have the tournament pressure. It's got to be somewhat difficult. Those would you say those fish are educated, or is this an approach that you would? advise taking when you're chasing those fish like on a lake like Simcoe that has all that pressure yeah they're educated for sure that they definitely get pressure throughout the season whether it's you know us tournament anglers or people out there guiding um they definitely get educated and like I was saying when I was saying stay back like a lot of times you can't like you see one 10 feet from the boat right if you are right on top of them and you start chasing them and Biggest thing I would say is just to keep throwing different baits at them. Throw something different. That's my biggest piece of advice to someone is, you know, throw something different. Because a lot of the anglers are throwing the same thing over, mm. over and over. Just kind of think outside the box, throw something a little different and get them to react. 
Well, you know, I'm going to be asking you what you're throwing because uh, that's that's going to be something a little different, I assume. But when you approach a smallmouth and you actually see when you get busted, right, you 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 ran up onto it. And let's say it knows you're there, but it doesn't leave. And I'm assuming that's typical of, of those fish up that way. What are you going to do uh, to try to get that fish to bite? Now, obviously, you're backing off slightly, but trying to keep a visual on that fish. Yeah. And how would you approach your cast with that fish, if you can walk us through that? Yeah, if I came up to a big one, say a five-pounder, and he's 15 feet in front of the boat, I'm looking at him, he's just slowly cruising. If he's going straight, I'll usually, you know, pitch ahead of him, mm -hmm. not directly in front of him. I'll, I'll usually okay. pitch 10 feet ahead of him and, you know, a foot to three feet to the right just to see how he reacts. A lot of the times they'll – come up, chase it, and eat it before it even hits bottom. Sometimes they'll come up and nose on it, and they won't eat it. And that's when uh. they're, they're interested, but they're not interested enough to eat it. And that's when I'll start rotating through baits, different presentations. So I think if I throw a drop shot and he doesn't eat it, maybe I'll make my leader a bit shorter, or maybe I'll throw something that, you know, is a bottom contact bait. An example this year on Lake Simcoe, they would not eat anything if it was not on bottom. I was throwing a draw. I really wanted to catch them on a drop shot. They weren't eating it, so I started throwing something else, and instantly they started eating it. And I could almost catch every one I saw. Every year, like every fish is different. Some mm -hmm. days it works. Like that day at work, they just the fish in general in the area I was fishing. They didn't want anything off the bottom. But you will get those days where, you know, this fish is gonna want a droppy. This fish is gonna want a tube. This fish is gonna want a spy bait. So you got to just kind of learn and see how the fish is reacting and let them tell you what they want. What would you say your top four or five uh, rods on deck when you're outside fishing would be, if you could break that down? Yep, spy bait. So when I'm looking, when my troll motor's on high, I'll just fan cast. Drop shot, something on bottom, a hair jig. Hair jig. So when you're actually looking for these fish and you want to cast to them while your trolling motor's on high and you just kind of get a feel for the area, maybe you're searching for, for some fish and you're not sure if there's any around, so you decide to pick up the spy bait. What would make you pick up a spy bait versus a hair jig versus, say, a swim bait when you're targeting those fish? Yeah, for me, it's just a confidence thing, and and I can throw a spy bait further than I can those other baits, so... When you're looking, I like to, you know, cover water. I want to be able to fan cast out this way, 100 feet, 100 feet, and just kind of as I'm looking, right? So I can throw the spy bait way out there on a 902 and just cover a ton of water. So and I, the spy bait, sometimes they don't eat it. Sometimes they'll eat the hair jig over the, again, that's something you just got to let the fish tell you. Through an area and I'm spy baiting, and then all of a sudden I start seeing them under my trolling motor. They're not eating the spy base. Mm -hmm. Then I'll pick up a, a hair jig or a. Let's say you're going along and you're throwing your spy bait and you see one. Are you reeling that spy bait in and grabbing something else? Or are you going to make a pitch with that spy bait first? Since I'll, it's already in your hand. I'll definitely pick something else up. You will. Okay. What determines if you're going to go up shallow? Let's say you found a group of fish and. The next day, you realize it's blowing, it's cloudy. Are you still going to focus on those shallow uh, smallmouth? And and how are you going to approach that? Because obviously, we all know high sun, calm conditions, visibility is key sometimes when you're fishing for those fish up shallow. What are you going to do in that situation? Are you going to go see if they're still around? Yeah, it all depends on the area. You know, I've had zones where I've caught, you know, big crews and smallies up shallow. And then we'd have a, a front of clouds roll in the next day. But it was one of those areas that was very far away from deep water. And they're not likely to travel off that shallow flat nearly as much if they were to, you know, have mm -hmm. a deep ledge close by. So a lot of times those ones will stay put. Maybe not in that exact area. They'll move around on the flat. But uh, they're still in the area. I truly believe that. But uh, if you get a, a zone where... You have this smaller flat close to real deep water. You will have fish push off into that deeper water. As far as as far as them moving on them 
great enormous flats. I still call them when the when the clouds come out. It just makes it a lot tougher because uh, you can't see them. It just makes it way more difficult because you know you could be forty feet off, and instead of going right, you should have went left. But if it was sunny out, you would have known to go left because you would have visually seen them. What is your typical setup when it comes to uh, fan casting and and using that spy bait as far as uh, length of rod? And, and line are you abrade the floral carbon or are you straight floral on that yeah i do so i run a nrx a 902 with eight pound braid to either a six or eight pound floral carbon lead i'll usually do about a when i'm tying my lead on i'll do about you know six seven cranks into my reel so i'll have about 15 feet of floral on there mm -hmm. having that little bit of stretch I've heard of some guys running straight floral, but I think it's a little bit too much. It all depends on the rod you're running too, but that 902, it's super flimsy, which is good. It absorbs all the head shakes and you know how scary it is hooking, hooking fish on a spy bait. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite brand of spy baits? I throw the duos. Do you? Yeah. Any yeah. particular size? Uh, the 90s. The 90s, yeah. yeah. So Cooper, as far as your presentations when it comes to uh, drop shotting for for shallow fish, what is that typically going to be as far as your bait and lead as well from the drop to the to the actual bait itself? So when I'm dropping down on them below the boat, I'll usually be anywhere from from ten to twelve inches. That's usually about where I'll start. I've actually gone up to you know going about three inches. I actually fished a Costa event out there three years ago out of Messina. Just a quick, cool little story. I was mm -hmm. over this one area and I knew they were down there. I was marking them. I'm like, man, they got to eat this drop shot. And I was throwing a 12 inch lead. I did three or four passes, three or four drifts, not a sniff. And I was stubborn. I'm like, I need to get them to eat this drop shot. So went back up and I just short my drop shot to like a three inch lead and literally instantly on the exact same drift just started cracking them. Again, you just kind of got to let the fish tell you. And as far as when I'm casting, I always take into consideration the angle. Mm -hmm. I would water you're in. So if you're in, say, five feet of water and you do a 150-foot cast, instead of your – so if you're below the boat, you're lying straight up and down, right, obviously? Yep. But if you do a 100-foot cast in five feet of water and you have a 12-inch – lead from your weight to your hook you're now only six inches off bottom technically so yeah. i have that in mind as well yeah i'm always playing with the leader length but you know 70 percent of the time i'm about 10 inches gotcha what type of baits you like to throw up shallow uh when you're when you're throwing a uh, drop shot i alternate through a bunch of different baits to be honest i've uh i like to experiment i've thrown Caught some big ones on the Exxon Slammer. Uh, I love through. I love drop shotting a little swim bait, especially like drop shotting for me. I'd much rather cast and drag than fish vertically with a drop shot. I just something about it. I just love doing, it, especially with that swim bait. You can cover mm -hmm. a ton of water doing it. Do you mess around with a, a wide range of colors, or do you, do you keep things basic? I keep it super basic. I'm, you know, for smallmouth, I'm. Straight black, mm. green pumpkin. Mm -hmm. Odd time I'll get new, you know, shot colors, but I see yeah. it, I keep it super simple. All right, good stuff. I got to ask you, what is your favorite place to chase smallmouth uh, in North America? Because obviously, from Canada, you get down to the states as well and do a lot of fishing. If if you could uh, pick one spot, where would that be? So St. Lawrence River obviously is up there, but uh, Lake. Lake Simcoe is incredible. It's uh, it's got some giants. There was actually a video posted like a week ago of a twenty or a thirty-five sack being caught, which is the record. Wow. Of the I saw that somewhere on Instagram. So there is some absolute tanks, and uh, you know I love how it fishes. It's one of those lakes that usually, if if you win, you're only getting six, seven bites a day, and that's kind of wow. fish. Yeah. I like grinding out, you know, six or seven big ones, and. Uh, yeah, I love it. I actually just finished a derby out there, the Canadian Open. That's probably another reason why I love it so much. 
is uh, was from that event there. We caught them pretty good, and we had a bunch of fun. You know, recently you had uh, a Bassmaster Open, and uh, you did fairly well, I would say, in that event. I believe I had five days practice out there. I spent, I think, one and a half days in the river because I knew, you know, if it does blow real, real bad, the point where we can't get out in the lake, that, you know, I need to have a little bit of a backup plan. So I spent one and a half days out in the river and then and then the rest of the time in the lake because 80% of the time if the lake's open, that's where it'll be one. And I just fished this one area. I knew there were some big ones and and it felt right. I ended up catching, you know, a couple of real big ones pretty quick in practice. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put my head down. I It's a big area. There's several fish that live in this area, very main lake. I'm just going to learn this area. So I literally spent three and a half days there just mm. learning that area, marking every boulder. Yeah, just just put my time in there, and it worked out. Obviously, I didn't win the tournament, but I'm happy with how it finished out. And, man, Corey, he's hard to beat. Yeah, they are. And so as far as as far as far those conditions on the lake, um, it worked out where you were able to go that same spot all three days? Yep, yep. Nice. So it, Day one, I fished my main area. I had 27 on day one. Went back to my main area on day two, caught 25. So, so you led on, I'm sorry, so you led on day one, if I remember right, right? Or second, oh. you're second. Because Cal, Cal was. I had like 27 one, Cal had like 27. Okay, going into the weigh-in on day one, okay, I don't know what time you had to come in, but let's just pick a time, three o'clock. As you're rolling up into uh, Clayton, like what's going on in your head? Do you do you think you got it, or are you like nervous, or are you like, I did the best I could? What was going through your head on day one? On day one, well, I thought, I mean, twenty seven pounds. That's uh, did you know you had that? I thought I had. I never weighed them. I knew mm -hmm. I had a bag. Like I knew I had, like in my hat, my head, I had twenty five. Gotcha. Thought I laid off my fish because I figured twenty five a day would win. Mm -hmm. and I kind of just went looking, but yeah, I weighed in. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> right, seven pounds, and I'm like, oh, and then to have someone beat you with yeah. even more weight is crazy. Yeah. Uh, so day two, uh, what did you bring in on day two? Uh, I was 25 something. So still, right there, and then leading. you were leading. Yeah, and then that's when that's when I'm like, oh, classic birth. Mm -hmm. and then elites points for the right year. so that was yeah. going through my head and i'm like man this is this is probably the biggest you know derby for me to date i'm going in the final day leading if i win this thing i go to the classic there was a lot going through my head and uh i didn't let it get to me on the on the third day i i honestly forgot about it all i just went out and had fun and I had the live camera in the boat and we had fun chatting at the camera. I love being behind the camera. So I had a blast. I just, I pounded on my area real hard day one and two. So I, uh, I ran a bunch of other stuff I had and came up with 21 pounds. But mm -hmm. was, is there anything you could do looking back on, on that last day that you would have done differently or maybe wish you would have done differently? To be honest, not really Travis. I, and that's what I said after the event. My my mom came up to me and she she asked me the same question. And I'm like, you know what? No. Like I I felt good the whole derby. I didn't spin out. I, I put my head down and I had no regrets. Just one of those derbies where you, you no regrets. Like it is what mm -hmm. it is. My day. No lost fish. I did lose some fish. Did you? Okay. Uh, yep. Yep. And I don't think I would have won. So. Sure, sure. I mean, still, heck of a job there. Tournament fishing, especially for smallmouth, is it's totally different. You know, how do you how do you prepare yourself as far as equipment, gear, uh, everything? Because there's so much that goes into it. So Obviously, fizzing's a big part of it. Of it, if you're catching them out deep, you gotta you gotta make sure to take care of your fish. Make sure you got lots of ice. That's the biggest mm -hmm. thing. You can't get that water too cold. So. Nitro, they, as you know, Travis, they have giant coolers mm -hmm. and fit about eight bags of ice in that cooler, yeah. throw eight bags in there. And I am constantly putting ice in there all day long. G juice, 
close the valves, keep it on recirc all day, and and those fish will stay healthy all day. That's the biggest thing for me is just taking care of my fish because one dead fish can lose you a tournament, and it's it's oh absolutely. Open your cooler, dump some ice in there, and and take care of them that way. So as far as electronics, how how do you how much do you rely on your electronics when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Uh, a lot, a lot. Um, St. Lawrence, for example, I uh, day one and day two, I I caught ninety percent of my fish on the live scope. Day three it was a different story because we had you know five six footers rolling in, and you just can't use it the same. It's constantly coming out of the water, so I kind of just had a blind cast. Mm. But between the live scope. And the 360 imaging, I am constantly looking at it. I'm sure I'm going to get arthritis in my neck in the next <laughs> What What is your setup at the bow when it comes to graphs? So uh, you mentioned live scope. Is that Garmin? Yep. So I've got, then, I've got at the wheel, I've got a Lawrence just for mapping. Mm -hmm. I'm in for side imaging and mapping as well. I like having both mapping. Yep. And then up at the trolling motor, I have... Lawrence for mapping, Hummingbird for 360, and Garmin for live scope. So great information. I got a bunch more questions for you, Coop. We're going to take a quick break and be right back. You're listening to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. Don't rush out to the water just yet. We'll be right back after this break. Well, hey guys, I teamed up with Beast Coast Fish and designed a sneaky little jig that's going to help you catch more fish, whether it be smallmouth, spotted bass, largemouth. This thing, for all you can see this, we're watching this on the YouTube channel, a sneaky little finesse jig, no weed guard, comes in quarter, three-eighths, and half ounce, very thin skirt, right? Not a lot of skirt material. It's designed to emphasize the trailer that you're using. So put your favorite trailer on. I prefer like a TRD, any type of craw, a smallie beaver works great. Z-Man makes a lot of great trailers as well for this jig. I've been throwing a lot this season. I've been catching some amazing fish. Like I am, I am a jig fanatic right now. I'll drop straight down on them over deep water. I'll make cast. I'll, uh, I'll actually drag this as well. Killer little finesse football jig. It's actually the Beast Coast open water sniper jig. Head on over to Beast Coast Fishing dot com and check them out today we're back to the small mouth crush podcast with your host travis manson all right good stuff i gotta ask you uh, i try to ask everybody on this show uh, these two questions number one i want to know what your biggest small mouth is to date personal best i don't even know to be honest you don't know no i don't because i caught one on simcoe last year that i think was my personal best it was a giant i'll send you a photo after this trap. sure great big one yeah had to have been seven seven yeah We've caught a few six and a half sixes simco like there's a lot of six pounders on simco okay yeah if you, if you want to catch a, a six pounder Simco's right to do it so so your potential personal best, we don't know the weight, but tell, tell, talk to me about the story. Where'd you catch it? Uh, what'd you catch it on? What were the conditions uh, when you did catch it? Yeah, conditions were perfect. Sunny, bluebird skies, flat calm, fish were shallow. I mm -hmm. came up on this one big wolf pack and they were they were all giants, like all six plus. Oh, yeah. Six of them down there. It was in practice and I'm like, ah, I want to stick one. Uh-huh. And the biggest one ate. <laughs> right. It was pretty cool. And then you had to let, let them be. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. They were gone in the tournament. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And so I got to ask you this question. If I was to say this is one bait that you're going to use for the next year for smallmouth, and that's it. That's all you can use. I don't care how you rig it. I don't care if you drop shot it, if you're going to put it on a jig head or whatever. Maybe, maybe it's a reaction bait. What would that bait be? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, some some type of swim bait. A on swim a bait. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. Talk to me about size. What color? Green oh, pumpkin. You're gonna, green pumpkin. And how do you see yourself fishing that swim bait most of the time? Because yeah. I know there's a variety of different ways you can fish it. Yeah, green pumpkin on a you know size two on a drop shot you know, six to eight pound floral, 
and just casting and dragging. Super Very slow. good. Very cool. Uh, Heck yeah. You can cover water. It's a, it's a very finesse technique, and you can really bomb it out there and get to them without them seeing you. So we're actually 51 episodes in for the year, and asking everybody who's been on this show that same question, I'll tell you what, Green Pumpkin is, and I don't know, I'm making the statistic up here, but it's got to be 80% of people have said Green Pumpkin. A large amount of anglers did say swim bait. I think tube or a Ned is probably at the top of the list, but there was a wide variety of different um, baits when it comes to, you know, what's one bait. Cause that's a tough question. That would be a, that would be a tough one. I'd have to sit and think about that for a little bit. Just kidding. Ned rig. But um, no, that's good stuff, man. I, I, uh, I, I always enjoy to hear people's answers when it comes to that. So we talked a lot about the shallow bite and then of course um, your past, open up on Lake Ontario fishing a little bit deeper. How do you approach? Cause I know we got a lot of anglers that love fishing deep. I love fishing deep, obviously with the right sonar setup, you know, you're running hummingbird, uh, Lawrence and Garmin at the bow, really being able to break down that water. Talk to me a little bit about your strategy going into locating fish deep. I'll do a lot of map prep actually. Like I, in the winter time here at home, when there's a foot of snow out, I'll hook my Lowrance up to a, to a nine volt battery and I'll just scroll on it every night, just looking at different lakes, studying lakes. So that's, that is one thing I'll do back home. But other than that, I'll just back the boat in and I spend a lot of time behind the wheel driving a lot of time. Idling. Idling. Yep. So you um, mentioned Lawrence and a hummingbird at the council. How is that set up when you're out there idling? So I'll have my Lawrence just for mapping and waypoint management, my hummingbird for side imaging, down imaging. And yeah, I'll just, I'll just get behind the wheel and idle. When it comes to deep smallies, there's certain things I'll look for, whether it's, you know, obviously rock piles, boulders, um, out in Lake Ontario, big ones get on boulders and there's some big boulders out there, you know, Mm -hmm. boulders that are five feet tall by five feet wide. And, You know, almost 80% of the time, if you can find a big boulder like that, there's going to be some big ones on it at some point. Um, They're not always on it, but if you find Mm -hmm. something juicy like that, it's worth coming back to in a day or two because they can, they can roll up on it any day. But yeah, I spend a lot of time behind my electronics, just looking for irregularities, whether it's, uh, you know, a big flat, that big sand flat with chunk rock on this corner of the flat. Again, 80% of the time, it's just a magnet. Like, it's just something they can sit on. So that's a big thing for me for deep smallmouth is just finding irregularities. Are you looking specifically for fish as well on the graph, or is it more structure? For me, it's more structure. You'll you'll, you'll obviously see fish on the side imaging and stuff like that. Like on them big sand flats, you'll see them. Um, But I'm typically looking for an area that, like I like pulling up to a zone and fishing, knowing where they're going to be mm-hmm. rather than finding, you know, cruisers on a, on a, on a sand flat. Because if you find them three, four days before the event, they could be 700 yards on the flat over this way. Mm-hmm. So I, I just like finding those juicy little zones that, that, uh, you know, they'll hold and, and sit on. So when you're, when you find a good area, uh, let's say on your side image, something that sticks out, irregularities or or perhaps a couple big boulders now you can approach it uh at the front of the boat relying on live scope probably heavily as well as your 360 what types of uh techniques do you start with uh when you're targeting those fish deep depends how high up in the water column they are depends if they're on bottom you know if they're on bottom and they're they're tucked right beside a boulder i'll throw i'll pitch a drop shot or a a tube or something like that out but you'll get those days where they're they're suspended or sorry 10 feet above the boulder and Mm -hmm. oh you can maybe throw a swim bait or you can throw that drop shot and you'll see them come up and fall it all the way down above Mm -hmm. and but uh, yeah it all depends what they're doing and where they're at in the water column it's fascinating today with with live scope technology back in the day and i don't know if this is the same for you but you would get your bite and you would feel like that fish was always on the bottom, but 
I don't know if you've seen this now where you see those fish suspended and just like you were saying, you, you're casting out and that fish actually follows it down and then bites it. Isn't that crazy? There's, there's so much more, I think, to, to fish that suspend and they're just kind of hanging out in the water column than we've ever thought. There's a lot. I've always said, like, even out in Lake Ontario, like, there are, I can almost guarantee you, there are so many smallmouth out in the best just chasing alewives and mm -hmm. that we aren't even seeing or fishing for, you know? They're just out cruising. And then coming back to, you know, when I'm approaching a zone, like, say, a rock, for example, typically I'll throw a drop shot down there rather than a swim bait or a spy bait just to keep the bait there. They're they're sitting on that boulder, mm -hmm. throw a spy bait or something that you're only in the strike zone for you know two seconds. So it all depends. If I'm fishing a flat, I'm more likely to throw that spy bait, swim bait, jerk bait kind of thing. Or as far as your goals in the future when it comes to smallmouth fishing, what do you have planned for for next season? I am. I actually signed up. I'm doing all nine opens. So oh wow, I've got a busy year ahead of me, and then got to make the elites. That's that's the that's the ultimate goal, and then I have some events here in Canada as well. So right. I got a year ahead of me, but it's what I love to do, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. That's a ton of tournaments, man, all over the place. Yeah. Which one are you looking forward to the most? I'm looking forward to going back to Oneida. Mm. Yeah, that was a I like that place. I fished the open there last year, and I had a lot of fun. Was that? Have you been there prior to last year, or was that your first time? That was my first time. Does that set up similar to some places you fished in the past, or, or what do you like about that place? I, I liked it because it was different. I've never really fished a smallmouth fishery that fished the way it did. So I like that. Like I like learning new things and fishing new bodies of water. And after that event, I learned so much, and mm -hmm. I just to get back down there and, and give it another go. It was pretty cool. Yeah, there's so many different ways on Oneida to yeah. fish for them. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. highly pressured, right? Yeah. I wish we could find a way to get away from the crowd on Oneida. That would be nice, but I, know, right? I don't know. I don't know if that's going to happen. What's a good way uh, people can follow you on, on social media and keep up with your your season next year? YouTube. I do a bunch of videos on YouTube. Uh, it's just Cooper Glant Fishing. Instagram is Cooper Glant Dot Fishing. Facebook Cooper Glant Fishing and uh, also have a website. I post all my videos and stuff on there, cooperlantfishing.com. Very cool. Well, I'm going to put all that information down in the description below, guys. Definitely give him a follow. I think you'll make the elite sooner than later, so that's pretty exciting. I mean, you got a great track record. What's that big trophy in the background, by the way? I keep looking at the big FLW one. That's actually uh, that was the FLW Canada Canadian Championship mm. um, three or four years ago. And what body water was that? That was Big Rito, another smallmouth fishery up north. Good stuff. Well, hey, you're always welcome back. Love to have you. Great information. Thanks. We appreciate man. you coming on. Thanks for having me. We'll uh, we'll keep in touch, stay safe, and maybe we'll see you at the Classic. Sounds good. Uh, see you guys. And as always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the water. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.